Well, thanks to Mina for that very um, helpful introduction. I wanted to go from what we know is in the TPP text from the from the leaked text uh, to to the reality that of the lived reality of what we've actually seen under similar provisions and other free trade agreements. That is the model that the United States is is in, is demanding um, in in the TPP. Just as an overview, I want to just spend a couple minutes talking about how investor to state dispute settlement, as it's called ISDS, you may hear around this week. Um, that's what we're referring to, and that's the arbitration of where investors sue governments, as Mina said. What are some of the costs to governments uh, that have, have been incurred? And what public interest policies have been actually under attack? And, and that we can expect in the future, and how some governments have begun to respond to these increasing number of claims. So as, as Mina mentioned, if there is a measure taken at the local level, municipal level, uh, sub-federal or national level, that an in, a foreign investor believes impacts its future profits, uh, they can launch a claim, and this is outside the domestic court system, uh, in, in the TPP country or in, even in the country, the home country of the investor. These are arbitration venues that are usually incorporated under the World Bank um, or the United Nations has a set of rules um, for arbitration, investor to state arbitration. In, the case is then decided by three private sector attorneys who are the arbitrators. The, the investor chooses one arbitrator, the state chooses another arbitrator, and those two uh, arbitrators choose the third. And, but what we've seen is that this is a very specialized community. And um, they actually call themselves the club, and they are um, a, a very specialized group of private sector attorneys, and they rotate between representing companies, suing governments, and serving as these judges or arbitrators. Um, there are not uh, the conflict of interest rules that we expect in, in, uh, from our domestic court systems, and, and even those very insufficient rules are not systemically enforced, we're seeing in the cases. And so there is this incentive for, uh, for increasingly broad interpretations of these broad standards that, that uh, Mina mentioned, because if you interpret as an, as an arbitrator a standard to benefit an investor, you may get a lot more business from other investors later on down the road to challenge other types of provisions. These tribunal rulings are not bound by precedent, so we see very unpredictable decisions. Um, and unlike in many domestic court systems, there is no outside appeal mechanism, um, and and the government cannot counter sue the investor. So the, it's a one-way challenge. Investors challenge governments, but governments cannot challenge investors if they have been not responsible or if they have engaged in, um, in behavior that has affected the populations. Just this graph is a, a, it's a, a picture of 15 arbitrators who have alone captured the decision making in 55% of the total investment treaty cases um, that have been taken. So, um, so you see that actually this is a very, they're actually individuals who are making, uh, making these types of decisions that have impacts around the globe. As Mina mentioned, this is very costly to governments. And as we've seen, this has become uh, um, a, a, an explosion of these cases. The tribunalists, the arbitrators, are paid by the hour. So they're not paid a salary, and so again, there's this incentive for the cases to go on, and you know, at corporate rates, a thousand dollars an hour, uh, to to go on for um, for years, and even if the government wins um, and wins the the lawsuit, almost always they are ordered to pay half of the tribunal costs. So even if you win, you've you've spent millions in tribunal costs, and that doesn't even count all of the legal costs for defense that uh, um, we see specialized law firms I come from Washington they're popping up everywhere where these thousand dollar an hour law firms are specializing in these types of cases the average legal cost to governments um, are eight million dollars per case that um, OECD found there is a case ongoing currently where the government has paid upwards of 50 million dollars just in legal costs and it's still ongoing there is a tribunal discretion to award unlimited damages, as we mentioned, which can include compound interest. The largest award 
against a government last year was a reward for $2.4 billion with interest continuing to accrue, and I will uh, mention that. that and, and this is for a small developing country where this is, this, uh, is a large amount of money. Um, the explosion of, of number of cases um, since these uh, trade agreements have been including um, this, uh, these, these extreme provisions have, have increased uh, significantly. Um, before 2000, there was an average of two cases per year that were brought. Um, but since NAFTA, the North America Free Trade Agreement, um, and in the US uh, a free trade agreement since 2000, we've seen uh, this increase. This is um, the number of cases, as you see, keeps going up every year. Um, there are now more than $3 billion have been awarded to corporations just under US trade and investment agreements, and there are other agreements around the globe as well. Um, and there are more than $14 billion pending under um, current cases under um, US free trade agreements only. So just some examples of, uh, I, I have many here and so I could go on for a long time, but we have, um, uh, in the back I have a list of some summaries of different cases that you might want to pick up. But the one that I mentioned earlier, uh, Occidental Petroleum, it's an oil company um, in Ecuador. They had breached their contract uh, with the Ecuadorian government and had sold off a percentage of their investment uh, to another company without informing the government, which was a, an important part of the contract. Um, the, the tribunal recognized the breach of contract, but still believed that Ecuador needed to award pay uh, the Occidental Petroleum $2.4 billion. This is, um, this is uh, more than half of the country's health budget uh, in the year is, is um, supposed to be uh, given to, uh, to an oil company. In, uh, in Mexico, uh, there is a toxic waste uh, facility run by a U.S. investor. Uh, the, the local government uh, required a cleanup of the toxic waste site because there had been uh, because of public health concerns, and they wanted to create an ecological preserve in that area. The toxic waste company successfully launched an NAFTA claim against Mexico and received payment from next Mexican taxpayers. So the polluter was paid by by the uh, the taxpayers of the of the community. Um, the prohibition of toxic materials um, in Canada, which was to comply actually with Canadi uh, Canada's uh, multilateral investment treaty on uh, toxic waste trade. They implemented uh, something to comply with that, and, but they had to then pay a $5 million compensation to a U.S. In investor. In a, in a current, uh, a, a more recent uh, situation, there was a Swedish uh, Swedish energy company uh, the, in Germany. Germany uh, in put into place environmental restrictions on a coal-fired power plant and had to and settled uh, out of court uh, and watered down their environmental standards. And now we're seeing uh, an, an additional claim by that company for $4.6 billion for Germany's uh, decision to phase out nuclear energy. This is an, an, some more examples of polluters seeking payment uh, in a very well-known case of Chevron, Texaco in Ecuador. There was um, uh, 18 years of litigation by people in a, the affected communities in the Amazon who launched litigation in New York and then also in Ecuador against Chevron for horrific contamination of their, of, of their environment and were finally successful in, in, in a historic judgment against Chevron. However, Chevron has now launched an investor state claim against the government of Ecuador, saying that their court's judgment itself was a violation of their investor right. And, that, and so it should be the Ecuadorian government that pays, if, if indeed the people of the, of the Amazon are going to be compensated. Uh, and in, in Peru, which is one of the TPP um, negotiating countries, I was, I was there not too long ago in a community that is one of the 10 most polluted communities in the world because of a metallic smelter that has not uh, abided by its contractual obligations to clean up its, uh, its smelter facilities. And after receiving two extensions from the Peruvian government, 
to not, um, a, to not clean up what it had agreed to do. And 99% of the children in the community have high levels of, of, of lead in their bloodstream. They have launched now an $800 million lawsuit against the government of Peru. And in fact, this interferes with a domestic case that the children that has been brought on behalf of the children who have been affected in Peru in the United States. So you see this as one more tool in the toolbox of large corporations to, to seek compensation, but even when they don't seek compensation, to chill important um, regulatory efforts. Public health policies have also been attacked. As I mentioned, one recent case that has uh, um, on that is related to our previous panel is that Eli Lilly, which is a large U.S. pharmaceutical corporation, has launched $500 million in claims under NAFTA um, for because Canada invalidated its patents for two drugs because they didn't comply with Canada's patenting requirements. They are actually challenging Canada's entire patent system. Um, not just around these particular uh, drugs, but challenging the, the mechanism by which uh, Canada approves uh, patents. This is a very concerning case around invest, uh, intellectual property and medicine prices um, that, that we're very concerned about. And as Pat will mention afterward, uh, in, in the next, as the next speaker, Philip Morris is using this, uh, these types of, uh, of provisions to attack anti-tobacco measures. The list goes on. Minimum wage um, um, uh, legislation in Egypt is being challenged by a um, by a, a foreign corporation under these rules. Financial regulatory uh, standards. Argentina, after their financial crisis, uh, had to institute emergency measures, and now there um, there are a, a whole series of of investors who are now seeking compensation for um, for those measures. Um, including, um, in the, the, the first one was awarded $135 million to, um, to a U.S. investor. And um, transportation policy, there was a railroad development company that did not build a railroad that they promised to build, and yet somehow received $13 million in compensation from the Guatemalan government uh, when they canceled their contract when five years later they had not built the railroad they had promised to build. So we, we are seeing um, a, a horrendous uh, um, number of these cases, and as I mentioned, if you have specific questions, I can answer about uh, many different types of policies that have been challenged and are being challenged today. One of the uh, results of, I think, the, the greed and the egregiousness of many of these cases and the corporations using these uh, provisions in a way that probably governments did not anticipate when they signed on to these treaties is that now governments are starting to question whether this is a good arrangement to be a part of. And we're seeing a growing trend of, the, of reconsidering that. Um, in, in South America, Ecuador, Bolivia, and Venezuela have withdrawn from the World Bank arbitration venue after they've seen these very uh, egregious cases being brought against them and the liabilities for the government. And they're beginning to terminate some of their bilateral investment treaties uh, to, say, to, and to try to come up with a, a better and more just uh, version. In South Africa, they had a top to bottom review of their investment agreements that were put into place after uh, the apartheid era. Uh, and after one of their black empowerment uh, laws was challenged by a foreign investor. They decided that this was not what they had signed up for and have started to renegotiate or terminate some of those treaties. And India, we know, is undertaking a critical review. We, we don't know what the results of that will be, but we see that large countries are really starting to, to question this. And as Pat will mention, that Australia um, has also taken um, some leadership here. And even in the United States, where there has been, a, where we, uh, the government continues to aggressively push this model in the TPP, actually all 50 state legislatures in the United States passed a resolution that they oppose investor to state dispute settlement in FTAs. So this is, this is a very controversial uh, a, a mechanism that is coming under increasing fire. And so it, we very much hope that this week that, uh, that TPP countries do not decide to lock in such a controversial mechanism at a time when really it should be reconsidered. And at, at the very minimum, there should be a moratorium on cases until they're able to really figure out and clarify so that corporations cannot abuse the system in the way that they have been. Thank you. Thank you.
you very much, uh, Melinda. Uh, we shall now move on.